Trek Profiles Podcast, episode 60, recorded December 2021. This is the Trek Profiles Podcast, where each episode we sit down with a Star Trek fan. We learn their Star Trek story, and we try to figure out why this show means so much to them, to us, and to all of you. I'm John, your intrepid host of this whole enterprise, and I welcome you to this, the Trek Profiles Podcast, Episode 60. If you wish to get in touch with us, you can reach us at feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. Warning! As we recorded this, we were early in Season 4 of Star Trek Discovery, so all previous Trek content up to and including that point is fair game and may be discussed during this episode. You have been warned, Human. As always, my trusty sidekick and co-host is the capably clever, consistently critical, but never cynical M5 Multitronic Unit. Greet the listeners, M5. M5 available and at full power. Let's do the announcements. Messages on the main console. The Trek Profiles Podcast is an independent show. If you'd like to support us, the best way to do that is to subscribe via your preferred podcasting platform. We are on all the places and would really appreciate you following us because that helps other fans find us. Another way how you could show your support is to make a donation in any amount to our official charity here on the show. That's the Children's Fund for Glycogen Storage Disease. A donation in any amount helps as they are doing some research to cure this terrible genetic condition. I talked about this more in episode 34, so if you're able and you'd like, please head over to trekprofiles.com slash donate and you'll see a link there to give directly to the charity. I'll also put a link in the show notes too. Thank you so much for considering it. There are some lightly edited outtakes and bonus material at the end of this episode. They will come after the ending audio cards. Enjoy them, or not, as you choose. Every interview I do ends with my Kobayashi Maru lightning round, where my guest gets five terrible scenarios with generally awful multiple-choice answers. After each episode drops, I tweet those questions out as polls so you can have your say. So let's review the ones from episode 57, where I interviewed the new Star Trek fan, Abigail Glover. Which class is the best class, the California class or the Parliament class? Abigail picked Parliament, but the peeps preferred California by a preponderance in the poll of 67 to 33%. Who's chasing you, the salt sucker or the giant space amoeba? Abigail accepted the amoeba alternative, and the amoeba also amassed an astonishing 67 to 33 advantage in the online poll. Hang out in sick bay with Dr. McCoy or engineering with O'Brien. Abigail opted for O'Brien, and online the opinion was 70-30, also in favor of the O'Brien alternative. Take your pick. Orbital skydiving or tsunkatsu. Abigail said skydiving, and that was also selected by a seriously sizable 79-21% to in our online sample. And finally, who is worse, Dalla and her crew or Peanut Hamper? Abigail picked Peanut Hamper, and our online populace preferred that pick as well by a prodigious 83 to 17%. Now, if you enjoyed those questions and would like to take a stab at writing your own for possible inclusion in the show, you can always send them to me at feedback at checkprofiles.com or DM me on Twitter. I look forward to seeing what you come up with. That's it for announcements, news, and weather. Let's move on. M5, roll it. The M5 acknowledges... His favorite character is Mr. Spock, but he also loves that mysterious scamp Q. He's a huge Klingon fan and loves that bird of prey, yo. He's currently located in Pittsburgh by way of Las Vegas, North America, Earth, in Sector 001. It's Paul Mattingly. Welcome, Paul, and thanks for being on the podcast. Hello, and thank you. So glad to be here. Yeah, it's a real thrill, and uh, I'm really thrilled to talk to anyone who's actually been involved in, at any level in actually Star Trek, broadly speaking. So I'm really excited about our conversation today. But the M5 is a harsh, harsh taskmaster, and he demands that I ask question one, which is, Paul, are you a Star Trek fan? Hija. Is that good oh, enough? <laughs> that's awesome. And And when did you decide, when did you wake up one day, look in the mirror and say, I've decided I'm a Star Trek fan? When did that happen? Oh boy. Uh, well, 
I used to go to Kings Island in Ohio as a child a lot. And uh, at that time, when I was around 11, 12, this was the burgeoning uh, emergence of TNG. And it had just become a sensation. So people, what, late 80s we're talking about here? Uh, yes. People sometimes forget just how big that show was. It was one of the top five shows. I think it was number one in the ratings uh, several times. But it was big, 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 big. So I had become a real fan and used to watch it with my folks. And I had two friends who lived right down the street who were TOS heads. Because I never got into it back in the day, but I was always interested in these books that they had and all this little ephemera that was floating around of, of uh, original series stuff. So when Next Gen came out, they were like, oh, you got to see the, the Star Trek, Star Trek, Star Trek. Eventually, I did become a huge fan and was uh, really loved watching it with my family. Uh, my, my mom and dad, we'd all, we'd all watch Star Trek Next Gen together. My parents were very indulgent of me, and they let me wallpaper my room. And so I had black wallpaper with tiny stars, nice colored stars, but tiny stars. And one wall was a mural of Saturn. Cool. And open space. Yeah. And it looked not dissimilar from the opening of the TNG show. And so this was totally separate that you had that. Totally separate that I had that. I was always interested in that. Always interested in space and UFOs and that kind of thing. Uh, but then... TNG kind of reinforced my interest in space and spacey stuff. At Kings Island in Ohio, they had a Star Trek store. Paramount had bought all these parks and they put Star Trek stores in their parks. And I bought a flat 2D cutout about two and a half feet long of the Enterprise D. And I was able to stick that on my mural and it looked very much like, you know, the opening of Next Gen with the Enterprise flying through and all that kind of thing. Nice. And I also had glow-in-the-dark stars on my ceiling that I put up there myself. I made a Bart Simpson constellation and a bunch of other stuff. But space, I was into it, right? When I got the job at the Experience, it blew yeah, me we're, away. We're going we're gonna to start talking about that in a bit. But Yeah, yeah. The, the ceiling was a star field. With the an actual actual models of the Enterprise and Birds of Prey hanging from the ceiling, it was as though my childhood room had grown up with me. It was really it was really something. So, I guess once I had that two D cutout of the uh, of the Enterprise, that's when things really started to lock on. Then I got a Playmates phaser, and it was all downhill from there. <laughs> so you lived across the river in Kentucky. Is that correct? I did. I did. That's where I grew up as a kid, Kentucky. And so, and my mom's from Ohio. So I'd spent some time there and I spent two summers working at uh, Kings Island. The first I was working uh, at uh, Mega Messamania, which was their Nickelodeon show. I was a host for what was basically their double dare show. And the next year I had some improv friends who were going back and they were going to be Star Trek performers. And so I wanted to get in on that. And sure enough, I finagled my way into becoming a Klingon for a full summer there in Ohio. Oh, uh, perfect. I, I want to know more about this. But, yes, but yes. first, I want to stick with the timeline. Let's go. So so this was late 80s. You mm -hmm. were there watching Encounter at Farpoint when it came on in your local market, mm -hmm. right? Do I have that right? You have and, that right. And did you stay watching all of the TNG and then all the Star Trek after that, like as it came out? Or were there some breaks or interruptions or what? There were breaks and interruptions when I went to school, uh, when I went to, to university. Uh, I was, but, but I still had a connection even when I went to college. It was really kind of funny. Floor mates of mine were way into Trek. And I can remember distinctly my friend Keith calling me into his room so that we could watch the premiere of Voyager together. Nice. And that was really cool. And I just, I remember that whole opening sequence and uh, <laughs> we had a board on our hall. I was in the nerd dorm, as you can imagine. And we had a board on our hall, you don't say. which every, yeah, every, <laughs> every uh, month you got to put up, somebody got to be in charge of the board and this bulletin board could be anything. You'd be like, you know, reach for the future. Hey, uh, let's keep uh, our planet clean. Uh, what are you doing for, you know, about uh, your sexual health? What are you thinking about as far as, you know, whatever, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but I did it and I and I picked jobs of the future. And I was like, and and so I made it. It was this is just smart aleck me. I put uh, to jobs of today versus jobs of the future, and it was like today lawyer, tomorrow space lawyer, today gar <laughs> garbage man, tomorrow space garbage man, and then you know on and on about five different examples of that. And my RA got miffed, and he was like, "This is preposterous. This is just." And, and my friend Keith came in, and one of them was doctor, space doctor. And my friend Keith, he came to my defense. He's like, I want to be a space doctor. I'm studying medicine, but I would love to know the effects of anti-G and, and all these things. You know, plenty of scientific research has been done uh, up in space to further the cause of medicine. I want to be a space doctor. And so he saved my bacon on that one. Uh, it was really funny, and they let it fly. Oh, that's outstanding. And so at what point did you go back and watch TOS? I'm presuming you have, but I, I just want to ask. That really didn't happen until I got the gig at the experience. Ah, okay. Until I until I moved to Vegas and was really invested in in because you have to remember it was not easy to watch the original series back then. You had to buy or find someone with VHS tapes. Of the thing now, we sold the VHS tapes in the gift shop, mm -hmm. so I would buy certain episodes. And as we went forward, I would buy certain episodes for training purposes, quote unquote training purposes. But it was Absolutely. wonderful to have important a, research to have a, to have a collection, uh, something of a collection. But even it was so cost prohibitive, as you well know. I'm sure you've probably gone through several different iterations of media, how your Trek collection has gone. But mine, mine certainly has. I'm still in DVD land. I don't. I haven't upgraded a Blu-ray, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I would say that's when I really started to watch the old school stuff and get more acquainted with that, and to honestly develop a real affection for Kirk. And I think he's still my favorite captain now. It was, it was Picard for a long time, but as I get older, it's it's more and more Kirk. See, that's interesting to me because one of the theories I usually hear is that like the first captain that you see is usually your favorite captain right. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's unusual to start with TNG and then decide you like Kirk. So I, I, I feel like you have to explain that a little. What's what's happening as you've been mellowing with age here, Paul? I, I don't know. Uh, there were always hints of it even during my time at the experience. I just kind of the more I got into it, the more, there's nothing without Kirk. I mean, you know, Genesis, boom, this is it. This is what it is. For better or worse, what Shatner brought to that character has really fueled, in a large part, this 60-year franchise. You know, it's really brought forward mm -hmm. what's what the, the craziness of it, <laughs> the, the off-the-wallness of it. Sort of, you have to respect how nutty he got in some ways because he was trying to justify the absurd, and he did. He did. He made you believe that there was a threat from a rock creature laying some eggs that was clearly made of styrofoam, that kind of stuff. So I guess just more and more, I, I grow to appreciate what he contributed and the fact that it all started there and you don't get anything without that nugget, as wild and crazy as it may be. Uh, that's that's kind of what it really comes down to for me. I still love Picard, but at a certain point, I don't know. I, I I don't. I think it's less mellowing. It's more like rubber hitting the road. Like Kirk will deck you. <laughs> Picard Picard's going to try and talk his way out of it. Kirk will throw a punch. I, I remember one of the episodes I, I often talk about is uh, Move Along Home from Deep Space Nine and watching it in that first season. And do you remember this one? Tell me. I, I uh, I'm, I'm bad with titles. It, it's the one where they're meeting this alien race for the first time. It's very early in Deep Space Nine. They show up and they just want to play games. Like they, they don't want to have a negotiation. And the, yes, okay, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they make them play, basically play space hopscotch uh, at one point. And I just remembered looking at this and looking at uh, looking at Captain Sisko, Commander Sisko at the time. And I'm thinking to myself, Picard would never be doing this. Right. <laughs> Picard would never be doing he this. He would never do it. And it's not a statement of values. It's just I appreciated how different he was that Cisco was like all into it, man. He's like, space hopscotch? Yeah, let's do it. You know, and he, he off he goes, you know, whereas Picard would like, he'd be more, I, I guess, aloof and sort of, you know, let's let's analyze this sort of yeah, way. Yeah, you <laughs> might be able to get him to, to play hopscotch on Picard Day. Maybe. 
Maybe. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. But but even then, but that's not all. That does speak to Cisco's love of games. Right you on. Know, his, right his on. Baseball yeah. obsession and all that kind of stuff. It really it was, it was planting a seed there, perhaps. Yep, it all fits right in. I, I was all for it. So uh, as we sit here now, we have a whole bunch of new Star Trek too that's being made. Have you seen all the newer stuff? I haven't. Unfortunately, I got a bad taste in my mouth from Discovery early on, which I'm going to have to go back and, and, and rewatch. But I was so filled with Klingon lore, as mm -hmm. you can imagine. I had to be on it because Trek fans were coming through every day questioning me about everything and we and you had, had to have, know we had to have answers about everything right and we mm -hmm. did we had to keep up very much because there were ongoing series while we were there that we had to watch as as close as we could episodically because week to week people would come in asking us about what's going on with the dominion war and all these kind of things and uh yeah so when i saw what they'd done with the klingons i got really crestfallen mm -hmm. the first episode First of all, they made them just kind of, we, we, it felt like a regression to me. Okay. Because we'd done so much work. Like always, every time you encounter an alien in Star Trek, give it about three years, they're going to be in the Fed. It just takes a little while for us to appreciate them and love them, unless they're Romulans. I think that's it. They're the only ones that never will ever be in the Fed. <laughs> the, the ultimate, uh, now, now you've just given it away that you have not been watching the show. The ultimate because, scapegoat. Uh, yeah, right. Well, that's what I'm saying. I haven't. Because I haven't that, watched that, it. That, that's, that's on the table now as we record this. Oh, so wow. We'll okay. Well, I mean, why? And I can tell you why it's on the table because they're going to betray everyone because that's what they do. Uh, but, uh, but it's so strange. It was just so strange to me right out the bat with Klingons being killed and then they had this deep concern to go and get the bodies and give them a proper burial. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Scream to stove a core and discard the corpse. That's how it goes. You don't care. It's a vessel. And I, I, I get, you know, here's, here's, you know, curmudgeon coming out, old, old Trek fan curmudgeon. And we've got to get over this. I know I got to get over this myself. I got to right. get it. I got to, I got to be open for do the it. new, right? I got to be do open it. for the new. But that kind of thing just really hit me the wrong way. I'm like, crack a, crack a book it'll tell you klingons do not bury their dead in that way they do not they they discard the body they view it as a as a shell when death comes they open the eyes scream to stovacor toss them out spirit is gone that's it it they do not care about disposal of bodies or proper burial and that to me which rightly or wrongly that to me smacked of a disregard for what had come before in a lot of ways. And I'm like, if you can't get the detail of Klingons, the way they handle their dead, then you clearly don't care. Now I've come to understand, I think, mm -hmm. as I have kept up with it a little bit, am I wrong in assuming that this, that a lot of that was mere universe stuff going on? No, that was that was all prime universe stuff. Okay, so that's prime universe but, stuff. But the, uh, the the main character that they well, not the main character, but but a key character in the first season that they introduce. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to spoil the first season here for you. Sorry. I'm fine with that. Uh, so we get this Starfleet captain who is very much not like a Starfleet captain. He's like, I'm here to win a war. We are warriors, and we are going to win this war, and that's it. Like he is not, you know. Let's talk to our opponents. He's like, no, we have to save lives. We have to, like, you know. And he's like this totally different kind of guy mm. and i was like what is up with this guy like wow he's something else turns out he's from the mirror universe okay and it just that that kind of deflated me a little bit because i was very interested in like the story of what made this starfleet captain this way you know and i was kind of wanting that story and they made a different choice which you know it didn't land well for me um so i was kind of nah, i lost interest with with it uh, at that point but um you know i would say you should watch it and you should check it out because i think it's important uh, to see where the show is going and the interesting things that they're doing um it's they're definitely i would say all right this might be controversial i don't know if, how my listeners will feel about this and i encourage them to to message me and to talk to me about it on twitter um in a way i think the show agrees with you that it was too hard to try to maintain a lot of the continuity because at the end of the most recent season they did a time jump a thousand years into the future or some 900 years something like that okay uh, and, and they said they said that it was because it was too hard to do a prequel show 
uh, and to try to, right. you know, do all the things and keep in all the constraints. And they just I wanted to escape the, all that. That was the Achilles heel of Enterprise, in my opinion. Hmm. That that series was doomed from this from the jump when you're trying to, you know, it's that's very it, it's not impossible, but incredibly difficult to help set up all that history. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let, let me just see if I can just get the parameters nailed down here. So you've seen everything from, let's say, Enterprise and before? I would say I've seen 75% of it. Okay. Uh, yeah. How about the uh, recent films, the J.J. Uh, Abrams films? Love the Abrams verse. All right, fantastic. So, so you're missing some of the some of the latest stuff. Um, a guy like you, in particular, I think you would enjoy the animated track that they're coming out with these days. Yes, uh, uh, I finally Lower had, Decks and Prodigy. I finally had a friend show me some Lower Decks, and I actually have a friend who used to work at the Experience, who is a voice actor on Prodigy. Amazing. Yeah. Well, Prodigy, I think, is fantastic. I'm totally enraptured with it. Uh, Lower Decks, I enjoy much more so than I thought I would. Uh, to me, the animated treks right now are just killing it. Uh, so yeah, I'm, the, well, I'm they very interested in what's happening. They certainly are replete with nods to fans. Uh, it was really, really funny. The episode that my friend had me watch it had basically little Marauder Mo style Ferengi out there with their laser whips just acting the fool. And I was like, this is this is what I'm here for this this yeah and they, they, and and, and the, the eight different pronunciations of mugatu oh yeah oh, <laughs> loved it loved it like all that kind of little stuff really because that's the kind of stuff we used to talk about and joke about in the back room doing our makeup every day too oh sure sure well one episode i'll definitely recommend to you uh is Wesdu, uh which i'm sure I'm, i've pronounced it incorrectly <laughs> but it's it's three ships okay and what it is it's a lower decks episode that covers three different well, technically four, I think, different ships in the Star Trek universe and what's happening on their lower decks. Uh, oh, so you have, you have, you have, and it's like this interrelated story that they're all kind of dealing with the same thing. So you've got our, our Federation people that are our normal, regular characters. Uh, then you have a Vulcan uh, who is like, you know, <laughs> at one point she's like, I do not agree with this course of action. And they're like, these emotional outbursts must be stopped. You know, it's, just, it's, 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 it's exactly like what you would think, you yeah. know, and, and, <laughs> and, and so there's a Vulcan and, uh, and then there's a, a Klingon lower decker who's like the junior most guy on his bird of prey. Oh, wow. And, and he's dealing with, you know, his captain and what's going on on that ship. And then there's also a thing with the Paclid lower decks, which is like <laughs> wild. I can't even, I, I, I can't even begin Paclid to describe lower deck. <laughs> Yeah, the Packlets play a big part in the show. Um, so I, I think if if you watch one episode of Lower Decks to see if it's for you, watch that one. I I almost would guarantee that it'll sell you on it. I definitely do need to watch more Lower Decks because the, what little I have seen, I did enjoy. And that is my kind of humor. And and knowing as much Trek lore as I was forced to absorb, it's fun to see because they, they do. They just pull from, again, just one episode I saw, just pulling all these really obscure bits of minutia which there's no end to that in trek and and it's just really fun to see that reflected uh reflected back uh what do you think about the orville uh, th this is my show bro i i ask the right? questions oh, oh, that, oh, oh okay, okay. <laughs> i'm giving you hard time. Do, do, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say for me that has felt the most trek of recent live action stuff that i have seen in a while and really gets me in the feels of next gen with a little bit of uh, snarky ha ha in there as well. But it's, there've been some episodes that have been really moving. Yeah, no, I, I enjoy the Orville. Um, I think, I think at the beginning it was a little too much uh, potty humor, I think. Uh, and they kind of got away from that and got into something a little bit more, a bit more grounded, intellectually right? interesting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and once they did, they made that move, uh, I was, I was more interested in it. So yeah, I watch it. I enjoy it. And I have Hulu for free through my uh, cell phone provider. So <laughs> I will absolutely watch it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So uh, we, we now have the uh, parameters of your Star Trek viewing and we have a commitment for you to at least get into some lower decks and i yes. guarantee man lower decks and prodigy are going to blow you away I will, prodigy's I... not your thing it's okay but <laughs> ch ch check out check out check out those other ones i definitely will all right so let's go back now so you're you're growing up in kentucky mm -hmm. and and uh, working at this uh place in ohio where you're mm -hmm. working in the star trek store now were you wearing a costume as part of this no so i i, I was working at king's island and uh, again like i was hired into the entertainment entertainment department as a performer uh, so I was, like I said, the first the first season I was 
a, a host in, on a live show, Mega Mess Mania. So we'd have, you know, a big audience, kids come up, we bring them up, we do Double Dare style stuff. Slime shoots out at the end. We get hit with it, you know, all that kind of thing. So it's basically Glorious. like, a, a, you know, a couple of Mar Mark Summers is up there mo moving people around on a giant banana car and that kind of thing. So for the for the full season of when I was uh, a Klingon, I was just a Klingon. I was in full Klingon gear, full next generation style uh, wardrobe, boots, everything. And it was made studio correct from uh, the actual, you know, Paramount stuff, uh, Westmore work and everything on the on the head sculpts, all that. And um, we walked around as basically photo ops during the day for guests at the theme park outside yes oh goodness yes that, that had to be hard oh my friend so i've done plenty of gigs away missions as they as you as we call them uh on the the terran surface which is not friendly to the makeup and the whole thing so one of the main secrets of being a klingon and i would say probably being any alien with westmore style uh, prosthetic forehead we would use panty liners in the mask because it would ride along the brow ridge. Mm -hmm. And so to prevent head sweat from dripping into your eyes constantly, you would put a fresh panty liner inside the uh, hard, it was a hard rubber mask. It wasn't the kind that they would use for filming uh, specifically. It was, it was more durable, mm -hmm. but I guess they would probably use it for like background, but it, you know, but, but that, but you keep that in there to keep the sweat away from dripping in your eyes and all that kind of thing. Another secret of the Westmore uh, school, which I actually got to sit in with him. He came to the experience and helped us learn our makeup techniques. Mm -hmm. After your final powdering, a very light uh, coating of KY jelly to give the flesh a more realistic appearance. That was another one of his little uh, last minute uh, tricks. And then just, you know, constant blending between. And I would I would use the eyebrows that they would send us. I would have attached to the mask itself and I would ask that they be inverted so that they would curl down mm -hmm. along the ridge line. So it would even better disguise where the mask started and my actual flesh began and it would ride right along uh, our ridges on the side there and then out to the side. And then you'd bring the hair, you bring the wig forward as much as you can to disguise those little sides by your temple. So uh, I imagine 18 year old Paul uh, in the grocery store, uh, walking up to the walking up to the register there with a whole bunch of KY jelly and panty liners and saying, this is all for work. No, yeah, seriously. We did. We did have some <laughs> days like that when we had to go get uh, had to go get stuff. I was, you know, uh, cleaning, cleaning the mustache uh, appliance and beard appliance all the time. Oh, God, I was using what is that really strong solvent stuff? We didn't use that after a while. It was terrible. It was really hard to keep that. But, you know, these these appliances were made for one or two uses mm -hmm. tops, and we had to really make them last for long stretches of time. So we got all kinds of different tricks with that. And you were dressing yourselves. We were dressing ourselves. Yes. So we got we learned how to do our own makeup. We had costumers who would help us with certain bits of wardrobe. I did have to have someone zip me up and back and get my spine hooked up there uh, with mm -hmm. buttons. Um, but I got to the point at the experience where I could go from street to full Klingon with the assistance of a, of a quick little help from wardrobe in about 45 minutes. That's amazing. You know, and, and that was, you know, with full blended stuck on good to go. Boom. Yeah. So, so you're working as a performer at Kings Island. Yes. And, and about how long were you available for these photo ops? I mean, how long were you doing in a, at a stint? We would, uh, we would essentially do half hour on half hour off throughout, throughout about an eight hour shift. Uh, you know, it ended up being like probably six and a half, seven hours after, you know, cause we gave, they gave us a little bit of time for prep work uh, and all that kind of thing. We'd always go in pairs to try and stay safe. Cause it was, I can't tell you all the stuff I had thrown at me and all kinds of craziness. We, I, I really came up in the mean streets of character work. Um, so <laughs> so I, I learned very quickly to how to reinforce my reality. And I had a good friend there, Charlie. He was a Vulcan and mm -hmm. he was exceptional at his job and a Trek fanatic. Whereas I was just a, I, at that time, I really just dipped a toe into the whole fandom. And he was obsessed with going to work for the experience when it opened in Las Vegas. He was just like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go work in Las Vegas. It was supposed to open in 97, but mm -hmm. it got pushed back to early 98. 
Right, 98, yeah. Mm -hmm. So after that summer, my plan was to just go back and do another summer at Kings Island, walking around, taking pictures and glad handing and whatever else theme park work would afford me. But Charlie sent an email out to all of us saying, hey, they're still hiring at the experience. They're looking for actors. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, who in the world has Klingon experience? So I packed the suitcase and I went for it. And he was kind enough to put me up with him for a, a couple of weeks. And uh, I got in. I got hired. My my chops are from improv comedy. That's okay. where that's what I always loved and 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 that's my main theatrical background so I, you studied performing arts in school uh yeah i did mm -hmm. okay and I, I i did nerd camp at 17 uh the governor scholars program and i was a theater major there for several weeks when we you basically played played college for a while and that the yeah, theater and wh that's where i discovered improvisational comedy was at at that uh, camp when i was like 17 and that was that was it from from then on uh i knew i wanted to do that in some regard so improvisation big thing and so i got hired as as a comedy actor at the end of the ride did you ever get to go to the experience i live in las vegas man i've oh. been to the experience many times so if you'll recall <laughs> at the end of the ride when the 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 uh conceit is that a shuttlecraft has smashed into the giant hilton sign and falls all the way down to the basement and then a, ha a handy janitor comes and gets you out of the crash shuttlecraft. Well, I started off as a janitor in that rotation. Nice. So I was I was down there at the end of the ride, down there. We're technically above. <laughs> we they took an elevator down to the gift shop. But I was there for the first not quite six months of 98. And I was just biding my time and champing at the bit, thinking there's got to be a, a, a character opening coming around eventually and sure enough oh so they didn't hire you as a Klingon. they did not hire me as a klingon but that didn't hurt to get me uh on board i don't think but i was not hired as a klingon no but the the story and this is what i firmly believe they finally had an opening and they they needed somebody relatively quickly but they were in contact with the people in north carolina which is where all the costumes were being held paramount mm -hmm. apparently had a very large costume warehouse in north carolina and my boots were there and they knew, and this had only been eight, nine months since I'd been walking around in Ohio. And they were, I think, honestly, some, some bean counters were like, Hey, these 5,000 or $10,000 boots, I can't imagine because they were full leather, you know, just over the knee, hip, hip level boots. I can't imagine the, the cost. They weren't cheap, but I think a good portion of why I got hired on was because I already had boots nice waiting for nice. me. And, uh, yeah. And so that was it. And then the rest of the costume, they were able to build out for me again, fresh for the most part. But, uh, I had my same, my, my same boots were made for walking from where I was in Ohio. And so you moved to Las Vegas just to work at the experience, just to work at the experience. Yeah. I packed a bag. I was like, well, you know, I, I was going to be doing uh theme park work again. I was like, nah, let's, let's take a shot. And yeah. Charlie left after about six weeks, eight weeks, and I didn't really? know anybody. And I was like, ah, but he had an opportunity in California come up and he went for a real job because he's also a computer programmer. Like I was saying to you, every true Trek person I know, they've got it on the ball when it comes to technology. A, a good chunk of them do. And so he left and I was just kind of like, ah, but I got my own place for the first time and I just had to learn a lot of stuff on the fly and it worked out. Like I said, I got into the character rotation. Uh, I met other improvisers who funnily enough, a lot of the characters that mm -hmm. were other aliens with me were also comedy improvisers and we got to be working with each other and it was great. And I was having a great time. This was about 2000. I got bored. Young me got bored. Young me got anxious. Mm -hmm. And I was desperate to do more improv comedy. Right. So I gave up the gig and I moved to L.A. to go study with the Groundling. Uh, if you're familiar with that comedy yep. theater. Yeah, Impr improv group, yeah. Right. So I studied with the Groundlings. And before that, I'd actually been flying out to L.A. Uh, to meet up with Charlie. This is when you could do like a $60 round trip to Burbank. 
Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So every weekend I would, and no TSA, nothing major, just off and on. Charlie would pick me up. But my first round of classes got canned after four weeks because the instructor ended up getting a job for Conan O'Brien. And I was like, ah, you know, I just got to move out there to get this stuff done. So I did it. I went for it. I moved out there and I took classes and I, I was, I was there for four months. I passed mm-hmm. my first round of classes on to the next one, but I just couldn't hack it in LA. The, the town ate me alive. It was just, the traffic was outrageous. I felt like I was adding to a problem that I couldn't possibly help solve. And so I came tail between my legs, crawling back to Vegas. And my girlfriend at the time was working there as well. And um, there was an opening in the retail department. And I had oh, to go, in the store I had to the, go back yeah. into the retail department for six months to basically show them, I'll stay around. <laughs> so, and finally another character opening came back and I got to be Voha again. Uh, so that was, that was a really trepidatious, interesting time. But while I was working retail, I had returned to Vegas and I was still kind of bummed because the whole improv mm-hmm. thing hadn't worked out. Not a week and a half had I come back and my girlfriend's mother at the time showed me in the paper that the second city was opening uh, a show and a training center, uh, a show in at the at the Flamingo and a training center. And I was like, this is it. So I was in the first run of training center classes there at, at the second city. Nice. And so I, I wasn't completely bereft of my entertainment stuff while I was doing these, uh, the retail gig and trying to get my, worm my way back in, uh, into the good graces of management and whatnot. Um, so, but that, that worked out as well. So I ended up very quickly teaching for second city mm-hmm. and I was an understudy. Uh, I actually got to be an understudy for Jason Sudeikis. So nice. I got to, I got to hang out with Ted Lasso. He used to come over. We'd have halo nights. Uh, he was, he's a very competitive and good player, as you can well imagine. Uh, you know, this is when we had to bring all of our Xboxes together and hook them all up in four different TVs and, and play. But that was great, great fun back in the day. But I ended up being an understudy for about four years. And then I finally got hired full time at the second city, uh, to, you know, write and perform in shows for about the last two and a half years of their existence there at the Flamingo. I wrote three shows. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was it was a dream come true. And I can honestly say I believe I'm the only individual who ever made a main stage Second City production that didn't get trained in Toronto or Chicago. All nice. of my Second City training came through the conservatory there at that Vegas. And were you still doing gigs over at the experience? Yeah, so there would be days when I and there was a year where I just worked. I would do an eight hour, which was a truncated, we were doing 12 hour shifts at uh, the experience. I would do an eight hour day at the experience. They would let me go. I would get a shower there at the experience. I would hop on the monorail, which ran from the Hilton to right. the uh, Flamingo. And I would do two shows at Second City that night. It was intense. It was intense. And uh this was the time when Jason was auditioning for SNL, as were a lot of other of the male cast members. So I was understudying for all three male cast members simultaneously. So I got called in consistently. And when I tell you all I did that year was work, I mean it. 75 bucks a show and a little bit of, of money from teaching with Second City. I made 10 grand from Second City that year as an understudy. It was insane while still full time at the experience. Uh, so it was it was a very hectic but really, really fun year, and it really uh, got my chops up. And uh, yeah, as you recollect the experience of working at the experience, mm-hmm. um, what was an experience you had out on the floor, out with the folks that stands out to you? There were a lot. Seeing cast members occasionally during special events was always a thrill. Getting to be there with their uh, Spock versus Q. If you recall that uh, audio book that got done by Delaney and uh, Nimoy, they were both there to do a reading from it when they were promoting it, which was awesome. Majel was there a lot, (laughs) hanging out and just being cool. She was just the coolest. Garrett Wong was the kindest. He had cousins in Vegas. He had family in Vegas. So Mm -hmm. he would come out quite often. 
he was always the most ready to play with us characters and to truly reinvest in our reality and, and treat us like performers and like real aliens, which was just so gratifying and wonderful. And, you know, we could refer to him as Harry Kim and it was just, that was really cool. There were some heavy, heavy times, not maybe three or four times. I remember very distinctly one time a gentleman spoke to me very in a very heartfelt way about how his father, who was a big time Star Trek fan, had gone through a battle with cancer and how because I was, you know, as a Klingon, you're constantly talking about the path of the warrior. Right, right, right. Do you, do you hear the cry of Kalis in your blood and all this kind of thing? And it, it turned into this discussion of my father was truly a warrior and his heart was really, really strong. And he fought with all he had to try and beat this thing and he couldn't. But I know that his, his warrior spirit goes on and all that kind of thing. And it's just like, Dude, I mean, it's, it's like, like, don't make my Klingons don't have tear ducts. You can't let me do this. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not allowed to cry out on the floor. This is not going to work. There were some heavy moments like that. And and not not even that life or death heavy, but just heavy in the whole this stuff, what Star Trek is. And it's so different for everyone. Mm -hmm. What it means to everyone is so different to a man. Right. Every person has a and different to a woman and to, uh, to every person has a different interaction, a different uh, relationship with Star Trek. And for some, it is just the most personal thing. And I, uh, several times people would tell me about how I got into my career as a, as a biologist because of, of Star Trek. I, you know, so many people would tell me about their scientific careers being inspired by mm -hmm. watching Trek. And that was that was very common. Um, and just I I always just felt a real responsibility to do my damnedest out there, because even though I had done it thousands of times, this was going to be the first time individuals were going to see me, the first time they were going to interact with a Klingon. And I wanted to try and be as authentic and as true to what I understood a Klingon should be, should be. So what would go through your head when you would see like a group of the uh, civilian Klingon fans out there uh, coming your way across the floor? For the most part, we would do our best to interact with them in a kind and, and, and cool manner. You know, we, we did, you know, we were, uh, they, Trek fans are, are some of the most welcoming and kind anyway. We had to always gauge it a little bit to make sure they didn't get too rowdy. That was always a concern. But for the most part, we'd sing songs together and talk smack. And yeah, it was it was actually pretty great. Convention time was always a highlight. Oh, sure. For many years, it was held there at, at the Hilton. So when convention time rolled around, oh, man. And those on some of those days, and this didn't even have to be convention time, but if there were good patrons... Mm -hmm. you could catch some of us characters just being out on the floor for like two hours straight before we had to go do touch-ups and take a little breather. But we would, we, we loved it as much as they did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So you, you stayed at the experience till it shut down? Almost. Uh, I was part-time by the end of the experience. So in 2008, I was just doing backstage tours occasionally and I'd come in if they needed an extra Klingon for a special event. But my like stuff. a Klingon wedding or something on the bridge, yeah, which I did tons. <laughs> I did tons of Klingon weddings. We all did that. But I was doing backstage tours. That was kind of what I, I fell into uh, towards the end there because I was full time at Second City. It's, it flipped uh, mm -hmm. for me. I was full time Second City and just doing part time stuff at the experience. But, yeah, I was there and um, I was there for the final day and I wasn't working that day, but I dressed up in a nice little suit with a little. Klingon lapel pin and went and talked to people. And I was doing some interviews and things for another podcast that I was working with at that time. It was Geek Shock, uh, which was my uh, friends from the experience who we all were nerds and we talked nerd stuff. And that was uh, that was what, what the genesis of that. Funny enough, Ron Lucas was there. I don't know if you're familiar with the ventriloquist Ron Lucas. Uh, he had that dragon puppet that, that, that for a long time back in that this was a, a oh yeah. yeah 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 oh now i remember right mm -hmm. trek fanatic 
and I got to talk with him about his Trek fandom. And you can still find that video somewhere on the uh, Geek Shock uh, Ugly Couch Show webpage if you do a little bit <laughs> if you do a little bit of digging. Uh, which also I will say, if you go to the Ugly Couch Show uh, webpage, if you're really interested, there are the legit, honest to goodness, real deal uh, recipes for the drinks at Quarks. From oh, Quark Breach and all that from stuff? From the bartenders who worked at Quarks. Nice. I am still buddies with several of those bartenders. Uh, who uh, one of them works at McMullen's? If you're so you're you're out in Vegas still. So. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. If you, you oh go, wow yeah you should go say hi to Darren. He'd love to talk and he'd actually be a great interview as well. Yeah yeah. Oh should, that's glorious. You should definitely hit up Darren at some point. So were you at the 10th anniversary of the shutdown uh, that they had at the Millennium Fandom Bar? It was quite the event. I, I was, was there. Not, it was awesome. I was not there, but uh, lots of my friends were there, and I got to see lots of uh, photos and remembrances of the time. Yeah, it was, uh, it was wild. Yeah. I was, Vernon, I was hanging with April for a bit and Vernon yeah, yeah, and everybody. It was yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Vernon became, I, I called him our de facto, um, Okuda while he was there. He was the guy who was always cataloging everything. And he was one of, he had one of the first, uh, digital cameras. And so he was, he, a lot of the great photos that you see from the experience are from like 2005 on when he started because he had a, a decent camera. We, we didn't, didn't have cameras on our phones and everything. We just, it right. Yeah. It it's not so, like it is today. It's yeah. so weird thinking about uh, uh, even up to 2008, it was really hard to capture video <laughs> of any kind of quality and or, or a lot of pictures, but yeah. So he, uh, yeah, he and April really carry the flame and it, it was really, really sweet to see at the end of the, the whole thing, April, and you know, she was the first hire and she was the last one out the door, basically, too, at the experience. She she kept the flame going. And she always does an annual Christmas party uh, mm -hmm. that all of our old school guys go to. And I haven't been to the Christmas party in a long time. But uh, I went about four years ago, and it was great to see everybody again. And, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a family. It's a weird, dysfunctional, crazy family. But it's made up of not just performers there, but a lot of patrons who would come all the time too. It's mm -hmm. an interesting conglomeration of people that were all brought together with Trek. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So I imagine in all of your working at the experience and in your history with Star Trek that you've probably amassed uh, some kind of collection. I had several. I've gone through so many collections at this point. I am a toy collector Okay. by nature. I still have a couple of figures. I've got, I'm setting everything up again here to, put on display i've got star trek Catan. nice i've got a couple of the plush bears that the experience sold from back in the day the vulcan bear and the klingon bear which actually had a really crazy hard rubber head uh <laughs> nutty little piece i've got a couple of klingon drinkware pieces i have four giant corks mugs which were the best soup mugs you could ever ask for microwave nice. safe big giant white mugs with quarks on the side um so i have a few collectible pieces from that i used to have a lot more of the playmate ships but i got rid of those my pride and joy i have klingon prints well i have a i have the poster from the opening of the experience mm -hmm. which is the warp and ride commemorative poster i have that and then i believe it's the same artist i have two pieces that i bought from the admiral's collection Nice. Which was our, which was our, our fancy. That's, that's the top shelf line. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I went to the top shelf spot while well, I still had the discount and I got the two, two Klingon prints. One of them has a bird of pr prey fi flying over uh Kronos, uh, you know, with a blue sort of hue to it all. And the other was the cover of an Omni magazine back a long mm -hmm. time ago as well. That oh, piece I was, was a subscriber to Omni magazine. So you probably remember the piece flying over these reddish mountains, uh, and then sort of some city scape. Uh, in the mountains themselves. Uh, beautiful piece uh, signed by Herman Zimmerman. Oh, uh, nice. Both of them. Yeah. S production designer. So, so I, I, I realize as we record this, you're in the process of moving, but if you have photos of any of that stuff that you can send me, I would love to put that up on the show notes page. I will. I will dig around. I have a ton of photos of all kinds of old stuff, but those are my, those are my pride and joy. Those, those prints. And uh, I've got to get those. They're, they're, they're all framed up, but I've got to get them reframed one of them fell off and got a little ding uh i mean the print itself is still fine but one of the, the things fell but those three pieces together i've had up 
in almost every spot that I've been in in the last couple of years. And I love those pieces. Those are my my treasures from my days at the experience. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So I know you've been to conventions because we used to have them at the Hilton where yes. you worked. Mm-hmm. So you were attending sort of as, I guess you would sort of have an in-between status, right? I mean, you're you're working there, but you're not really working there and you're not a guest. You're sort of in some gray area. Mm-hmm. But what, what was your impression of, of the Star Trek conventions that you did go to there? I, I, I always enjoyed it. And I again, it's, it's, it's really just about the people. And the, the more of those you go to, the more you realize it's just a chance to 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 see old friends, right? That's that's yeah. how it would be. And and you know that that was a weird thing for me too because we were still in character, we were still on the company dime. We couldn't get in and and you know talk shop really until we were off the clock. And so it was really kind of an exciting time when convention would roll around if you got out of makeup and could make it out to actually talk to people a little bit, a little bit as a civilian, um, which was kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, while you were there, you still had to be very on your game and, you know, mm-hmm. photo op first and really just try and be, you know, cool and respectful of everything that's going down. It's amazing. It's an incredible culture and just so cool to see. It was always fun to see the, the technological innovations as they grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. They were always some of the fun stuff was always first uh, debuted there. Voice recognition software, which now yeah. no big deal to talk into your phone and have it type stuff up. But then you'd see that at the con and be like, this is where it's going. Right. But it would take a long time. Uh, I remember my friend bought one of those hundred dollar wall sockets that had Migel's voice on it. And you could talk to, to turn on and off your lights. And it was like, it was just like, <laughs> it's like a really high end clapper that you could scream at and that would kind of work, but it was just like the, 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 the van, the tech advancements. That was something that I always found fascinating. I, I, I had a PC game that was, I I could look it up, but I had whatever PC game it was. And this is quite a while ago uh-huh. um, that was the Klingon language tutor. Uh-huh. And, and it would give you things to say, and you had to speak it into your computer microphone. And oh, it would wow. Grade you. I, oh, this, how the, funny. The, the, this, this technology barely worked. Right. It the the barely voice recognition worked. was just kind of like, mm. right. or, or maybe I'm just covering up for my terrible Klingon accent. I There's, don't know. But it, <laughs> the Klingon accent, I mean, when you, when, you, when you really break it down and you realize it was all just based on guttural grunts from James Doohan from the yep. jump, like, that's the start. I mean, Mark Okran really fleshed it out. And and gave it sort of a a, a very uh, Hebraic flair with all because he you know that he was a master of uh, Hebrew linguistics so that's mm-hmm. where a lot of that uh, when you when you because it's undeniable that there's the connection there when a pain stick is called an oi knock oi <laughs> you know <laughs> okay good good gag Mark uh, fun stuff but it, yeah it's it's really cool um, but yeah those. We, I used to, I mean, when I started, I had it on tape. I had Klingon for the Galactic Traveler and Conversational Klingon on audio cassette. That's how mm-hmm. I was practicing my stuff. So I didn't even have the advantage. Because you knew that there were people who were going to come up and try to talk to you. I can't tell you. I mean, I have to, you know, look uh, the Well, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. It, it, it's stuff like that. I mean, you have to know these phrases. So I, I guess I just want to dwell on this for just a moment more, maybe just another question or two, mm-hmm. uh, which is, as someone who was a Star Trek fan, how was it actually working in Star Trek as a fan? I mean, w- were you getting exhausted at some points or could you not get enough of it? I mean, h- how did you manage that? It was tough keeping up with the day, the week to week episodes, but small price to pay to be involved in something so cool. I, I mean, there came a point where, especially after I left and came back, I understood how special that place was. And so, no, I, I never really got tired of it. I mean, every job becomes a job, right? doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You know, you can talk to the people who were on the shows. They were like, you know, I, I'm like my God, if you've heard the, the horror stories, like from Kate Mulgrew, when she's having to juggle uh, rearing her first children and all the, you know, it's like, how could you possibly be a new mother and keep up with all that? Even if you're getting to go play in space, it's yeah, just, yeah, it's, yeah. you know, there's, so, you know, the realities of life can sink in, but that was the other beauty of it. Well, like I, like I talked about before at, at uh, Kings Island, I'm dealing with these hyped up teenagers screaming just coming off of a roller coaster, 
right? And they're wanting to fight and get crazy and, you know, all the kind of stuff that teens want to do. And, you know, ah, hey, space guy, blah, blah, blah. Let me throw pennies at you. Uh, crazy. But at the experience, everywhere you turned, our reality was reinforced, not yours. You were the you were the guest. You were the invading force. This was a place where aliens could clearly exist. So that was something really special. And like I said, having come from the parks, knowing mm -hmm. how special it was to have such a fully realized 3D environment to play in, I didn't take that for granted at all. Fantastic. Well, the M5 is suggesting that I ask you about some episodes. Are you game? I'm ready. All right. Well, one of the first episodes that the M5 suggested that we talk about is not an episode at all, but it's a movie, uh, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. And the M5 tells me that this, this movie is of particular interest to you. And so I want to ask you why he thinks that. I, I love the movie. I think it's one of the best ones, but it's what it means to me in the grand scheme of my journey with Star Trek. This was something I went to see while I was in college with my friend Keith, who was always pushing me to check out more Trek stuff. Mm -hmm. And I got to see it in the theater. First Star Trek film I'd ever seen in the theater. Uh, I'd seen four on VHS as a kid and five, everyone kind of shot, shooed me away from uh, even my Trek fan, friend, fan friends back in the day were like, Ah, you can pass on five. Ah, there's no passing. You have to watch it all. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm I, sorry. I've, I've since <laughs> I've since corrected the error of my ways, uh, but uh, <laughs> but it was just uh, it was awesome. I really enjoyed it in the theater, and having no idea what a huge part of my life would be being a Klingon <laughs> and seeing all this, and Keith ended up. Uh, like I said, he was a big Trek head also. And I knew one day he'd end up at the experience as I'd lost touch with him. Mm -hmm. But sure enough, he showed up at the bar one day and I was able to, through kind of a, a little code speak, get let him. It, it, it took him forever to figure out who I was. He didn't recognize you under the under Not all the a, kit. No, I was. Com I, that was the other thing. My anonymity was complete, complete when I was when I was in full gear. That had a very different affectation in my voice and, you know, all of it. Yeah, I, d I do not sound like me at all as Voha. And I can maybe do a little Voha for you. Uh, a little, give, give me a little bit of that Klingon. Let me, let me, let me get a little water. It, it, it would take me a day to really get in there. No, no, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but, mm. you know, I, I think this is this is what we're here for. Man, this is what my listeners yeah. love. This is what they want. All right. So let's say you're at the bar and Voha would come up to you. And 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 I, I'll just go through some of my stuff here. We go. Greetings, human. Nuchner. Your day goes well, I trust. Have you had battle recently? No. Oh. Mm. True shame. Mm. Yes, ah, uh, delicious. No, I, I have had my fill of blood wine this day. I will likely sample some prune juice before the evening. Mm. <laughs> I find it quite good. And readily available. Not all humans tend to like it. Hmm. Uh, and then, and I, and then I, I, I was the singing Klingon. So if you saw a Klingon singing opera at the that bar, was you. that was me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's glorious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is glorious. Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to do some Klingon opera. All right. Uh, and again, a little... This is me asking you to do a Klingon opera. It's a little muddled, <laughs> but... Uh, but I. I, I, I Bagda tumo soja duro yaja ke o yaja ke o yaja ke o and then uh, I I had wonderful I had about forty percent of the lyrics I would kind of make up some of my own uh a little bit about halfway through got a little muddy sometimes but yeah. The spirit was there. And uh, yeah. Oh, I bet people ate it up. Oh, I imagine did. that that your improv training had to be very helpful. Well, that was just well. it. I And, you know, that's both careers really. I mean, I was con uh, I was spending all day improvising in a very specific box as a Klingon, but improvising all day long. And then I'd go take more classes and, and, and improvise on the stage 
it, they both fed each other very much, very much. Yeah. I was I was in the catbird seat. Well, I feel like we've we've lost the plot here because I was asking you about why Star Trek VI was so personally meaningful to you, and and I feel like we haven't gotten there yet. So well, help, so help me out again. It's that it's that personal connection that the mm -hmm. fact that a, a friend who took me to see that film a decade ended up, before ended yeah. up being at the place where I was now an official Klingon. That that memory really hit. Also, uh, Kim Cattrall. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you all day. Uh, yeah, that, she, she's the best in that movie. <laughs> she's definitely something else as Valeris uh, yeah. with, the, with the shaved uh, oh. sideburns. And uh, of course, she's also a baddie. So you can't forget that. Mm -hmm. She's actually a villain. Spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For the 80 year old movie. Uh, yeah, it's it's great. Um, I don't know. It's uh it's one of those things that movie just, it became kind of a linchpin, like I said, for where my life went. That film is also a lot of people's experience with Star Trek. It was a very popular film in its own right. And so when people saw me walking around as a Klingon, I'm a Klingon that fit that era and that style. Mm -hmm. So I'd get a lot of questions about it. And that was also the origin of uh, Purple Blood. which Yeah, the Pepto-Bismol blood. Which I have an answer for. Uh, of course it appeared purple, but one must consider the atmosphere in which the blood is discharged. Look upon your veins, human. They appear blue to me, but surely the fluid within is far from blue. When it meets oxygen, the red increases. Hija, Kobe, Hija. So, the same can be said for our blood. The different atmosphere nice. changes the color. Very nice. I mean, we Very had nice. to, we had to dance around so many max sized plot holes, explaining the foreheads, explaining all. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> yeah, you had to be fast on your feet for sure. A lot, because you know, no matter how much you study, there's going to be some super duper nerd who is our people who's going to walk up to you, who's going to ask you something you may never heard of. Or <laughs> one time, I got tripped up when somebody asked me where I was during the Battle of Wolf Three Five Nine, and I didn't have a quick response. And I was just like, ugh. But that was when Wolf 359 had only been talked about a week ago on the show. So I'm like, ah! You know, <laughs> just, just pulling my hair out, trying to stay on top of you, stuff. You can't enjoy the, the Star Trek episode because you're trying to take notes, right? Because you know someone's going to ask you about it. <laughs> absolutely. But it certainly kept me on my toes. All right. Well, then let's uh, talk about a different episode. Let's talk about, ooh, an animated series episode. Mm -hmm. Season one, episode two, yesteryear. Now, I have to say, in my... In my rewatching of the episode in preparation for this, there's some things that, that really hit me very, very profoundly, actually. And one of the things I always say about the animated series, the original animated series now, as far as Star Trek goes, right. is that it's amazing to me that some of this stuff got on the air. Like, they were really going for it with a lot of this stuff. But uh, I, before I go too deeply into my own personal observations, I want to know from you, Paul, uh, what's going on in this episode and why is it special? I saw it as a kid and it really hit as a kid there. It is, it is a meditation on death. It's a kid's show. That's a meditation on death. Yeah. And you got to Saturday be, morning cartoon style. Yeah, and you got to be ready for that. And it's, it's wonderful. It's so well done. That's a home run. Not, she has so many greats, but that's one. I don't know that everybody realizes just how good and that episode, aside from how good it is just as a self-contained, interesting story, mm -hmm. and it is a really good episode of Star Trek, that's, that's one that you could probably just, you could send that to anybody and be like, if you like this, you should probably watch some more of it. But it's got wonderful history about Spock, mm -hmm. stuff that you never saw on the original series that fleshes out what it's like to be a young uh, Vulcan. And all that kind of stuff. And watching it now, I honestly think a lot of that is the genesis of the Abrams verse. Yeah. How, how many times have we seen like the little Vulcan kids picking on little baby Spock, right? I exactly. Mean, we saw the exact same thing again. That, I mean, it's it's a straight lift, right? It's not it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Abrams watched that episode and it and it also deals with Spock meeting Spock. 
Yeah, which is very wild. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of mind bendy. Exactly. Um, uh, I'll tell you, as I watched it, one of the moments of it that I think hit me very profoundly was uh, actually uh, Commander Thalen, the Andorian, the uh, first officer of the Enterprise, because basically he's told that we're going to reset the timeline and you may not even exist. And he's basically like, okay. Yeah. And and I think to myself, what? Like, what? Like that, that is not, you know, by the way, you know, go out to the store and pick me up some, you know, beer nuts and, uh, you know, some straws. I mean, this is like, you know, <laughs> you, you, you may not have ever existed and we're going to do that. Okay. And he's like, okay. And it just, just the, uh, dignity that this like silly animated character he takes that right and just accepts it i i thought man that's that's some amazing stuff and uh, maybe it's because i'm getting older and i'm thinking more about mortality i don't know but it, it's something that i thought was very profound as i watched it it is it is profound and it and it's also like how many times have we learned anything as significant about what may be construed as the temperament of andorians right that's as close as we ever got to them being this stoic to learning about that right to, yeah like that's again working as a character you had to grab I mean, klingons were lucky we had a glut of stuff to pull from and it's not hard to kind of just scream at a wall and you, you can get away with it and that, that can be a, a klingon character but you know some of these species that didn't get as much airtime what makes them tick you know and this is one of the only examples that i can think of before uh Jeffrey Combs really put his stamp on it as to what an Andorian is. Yeah. Right on, right on. Yeah, we didn't get that much. Uh, we didn't get that. We didn't get hardly anything. Uh, I think there were there was one uh, image of an Andorian in all of TNG, and mm -hmm. that's it. Uh, and we didn't get much else of them after that. I mean, even so. in the original series, the Andorian wasn't an Andorian. It's like you know they, that's they right. got the short shrift. That's right. He was a spy. Yeah. So, okay, let's talk about another episode. Let's talk about TOS Day of the Dove, TOS Season 3, Episode 11, with the wonderful and amazing Michael and Sara as Kang. Yes. And also probably one of the most disturbing moments in all of TOS. And I'll just let that hang there and, and, see, if, and see if you want to say something. I was disturbed something. the same way that you were. Yeah, we'll see if we're on the same wavelength here. So tell me what's going on with this episode and why is it on the list? So this is season three, which many can argue is a hodgepodge of Monster of the Week. And that's not wrong. This Monster of the Week was an energy being that fed on rage and anger. And it's an interesting tale. And it sh again, it shows that whole thing of... If you've met a species, give them three weeks, they'll be in the Federation. You start to see those those little seeds planted of maybe humans and Klingons can find some common ground. Yeah, it's it's cla and it's classic Klingon. Like that that depiction of what a Klingon officer is, I tried to really Kang was was really a big influence on how I held myself throughout, yeah. And, and any character that legit straight up says 40,000 throats may be cut in one night by a running man. I mean, that's not someone to be trifled with. No. And that <laughs> and that's one of those things that we had to learn as well. All those great Klingon phrases. Only a fool fights in a burning house. One of some other uh, classic one. Of course, today is a good day to die. We would rather live on our feet than die or rather uh, die on our feet than live on our knees. That, that's appropriated from some other source of, of, as well, I'm sure. Tach <laughs> bay. You know, what's the to be or not to be? Right, right, uh, right. We got to experience in the original uh, Klingon, uh, all that. Tach bay, pach bay, I believe it <laughs> says it. Uh, but yeah, the way that Klingons were depicted there, there's a certain charm and dignity that, uh, uh, you know, because for two seasons, it's like, oh, Captain, that. They're savages. They'll kill us all. They're monsters. Just kill them. You know, we start to see that, no, there's there's a society there, right? That's something I also had to bring to my work, too, is like, you know, I had to say straight up, hey, not everyone hears the cry of the warrior in their blood. Not every Klingon goes off to war. Some must bake the bread. 
You know, I got Klingon chef right here. Right, Klingon some, chef. He's some right above must me. Bake the bread. That's what I would always say. Like, how can you? You you know, we are as diverse a people as any. But uh, but your your federation is not always quick to see the differences and the diversity. They just want to focus on the military power and the military uh, prowess. And it was just interesting to see a military man show some other sides of his personality through his companion, through his wife, you know, and that kind of thing. And it just, it, again, we always, it just takes a little while and we humanize every species we encounter. Uh, we find some empathy. We find some common ground, which is great. Which is great. That's what Trek's all about. I think that was one of the, the starting points for Klingons being a little more uh, uh, humanized and uh, em empathetic. One of the things I love to point out is when you go back to the very first time we see the Klingons in person, which is, of course, the episode on Organia with Kur and all of that, and they're, they're talking about the origin of their conflict. The very first thing that Kur says as to why the Klingons are enemies of the Federation, the very first thing he says is he says, you have interfered with our trade. <laughs> it's the very first thing he says. And, and you think to yourself, what? <laughs> is that is that you have interfered with our trade therefore we're enemies like that's that's the first thing that comes to his mind i i realized that you know they were not trying to world build in the way we do today no but i just love pointing that out to people yeah that, that was the thing that he brings up like the very first klingon we actually meet the very first thing he says as to why they're enemies of the federation is because like you're interfering with our trade <laughs> it's a very non-klingon thing to say and, i love it and lucas stole that for the prequels the first thing, it all starts off with trade wars. It's all about Oh, that's trade. right. Oh, so you're, you're trying to bring some Star Wars in it's here. All about well, trade, I, I, it's all about trade blockades. <laughs> uh, I got the deflectors up, man. We're not going to, we're not going to talk about that. No uh, worries. No. Uh, so, so tell me about this disturbing moment in the episode, because I, I really feel like we got to talk about this. Uh, it's something that, you know, maybe at the time when, you know, eight year old Johnny was watching Star Trek, I probably didn't pick up on mm -hmm. uh, how insane it was, but uh, there, it, it's very much hinted that Chekhov was going to rape the Mara character um, in the episode. And I, I found it quite disturbing and, and quite reprehensible, um, even though, of course, they're under control of this alien right. being and all that. But I just think to myself, I, first of all, I can't believe they got it on TV. I mean, mm -hmm. just at a meta level, like I couldn't believe they got as far as they did with what they did show and sort of where they were going with it. I thought mm -hmm. that was like amazing as far as just the actual ability to get it on the air. But um, also it was just, rather disturbing and it's disturbing today still um i'm wondering what your impressions are of it well that's just that's just it right and uh, original series is part of that too when you've got the sensors breathing down your neck you get creative and you do push harder right and it's all about implication and nuance and the violence that you don't see right because it becomes that much more horrific in your imagination and that's a, that's a strength of the entire series, I believe. And I think upon that with like just having rewatched a lot of these and thinking about Star Trek VI when Praxis explodes. Mm -hmm. It's a quick cut to a matte painting of a moon blown up and then about 10 seconds of a very wavy, bad, interference-laden broadcast from a Klingon screaming in pain and his the place he's broadcasting from the room he's broadcasting from is on fire and that's about it and then you cut to the chancellor or one of the chancellor's assistants coming up and saying everything's fine here we're cool we don't need any assistance and just to intuit the level of you know you can multiply the level of horror that's happening on a world that just explodes over half of it exploded away. What you can envision, the horrors you can envision in your mind are exponentially more terrible than anything a special effect can show you. And that's, Trek is very good at that. Very good at letting you fill in the blanks and, and go further through their implications and, and just the raw emotion behind what they're, what they're putting out there. Earlier on, uh, I don't remember if this was actually before we started recording or not, but you were talking about uh, William Shatner and how your impressions of him as an actor have changed over time. And you talked about the fact that he had to sell it. And I think that that is actually one of the endearing things about TOS mm -hmm. 
is that because the effects were at the state that they were when they made the show and the budget that they had was what they had, that the actors really had to sell these things and they had to believe it, right? Which today, and you know, this is not in any way a negative comment at any of the actors who are on modern shows, especially modern science fiction shows, is that they don't have to sell it, right? I mean, the effects are so good now, even on a TV budget, that you know, if they want, you know, two worlds colliding, they can do it, yeah. <laughs> right? They they can make it, mm -hmm. and and you can see it. Whereas in TOS, they didn't really have that. So they had to rely on more of the actors' responses and you know these sort of things. I mean, there's there were times we didn't even see an enemy ship. We're just told there's one out there in the show because right. they didn't have the budget to show it to us. Right. You know. Yeah. And I, I think that's part of it here um, is that the imagination of it can be more horrible than what they actually show you. Yeah. Right? There's what's more what's more terrifying than an imagined invisible enemy, an imagined threat. But also, I think there's something to the. Uh, overcoming the uncanny valley where we find ourselves currently you know there's a there's a certain point to me where a lot of this effect stuff it just doesn't resonate at all because you just see 80 million invading ships fly through a part of the nacelle and you're like w w is this even happening is it what what am i even looking at it just looks like such a a mess it's almost too much to process it's impressive but it it loses that raw connectivity. Like when the when the M113 salt vampire turns around and gives you that goofy mouth open freak show look. Yeah, it's it's Saturday morning cheese, but it's also like weird old haunted house, right? Like that that stays with you. That very it's a very clear re, you your mind knows it's real. Whether it thinks it's silly or not, your mind knows that is a tangible object created from actual material that is being that is reflecting light and interacting with other people in a way that is tangible. And that's horrific, too, in its own way. Even though it's a goofball monster, I really saw that Gorn touch Captain Kirk. Mm. I didn't see so. And, and the flip side of that, yes, those actors have to sell it hard. But they are actually looking at the thing, not a tennis ball in a green screen. There's a difference, a difference there, a visceral, you know, yeah, it might be silly looking. It might be a little bit odd, but it's right there. And it just adds a little more realism. I, I don't mean to try to keep trying to sell you on watching the new show, but I will say that in season four Discovery, one of the things they added to the show from a technical perspective is um, they're no longer, well, I imagine they still are using some green screen, but they yeah. have an AR wall, uh, which is this new technology that they have. Uh, so when the actors are on these like virtual sets, they're seeing the things that are actually there. Oh yes, that's the new that's the new production that's trip, the new thing. right? So so when they're turning around and saying, "Look out the window and see the spaceship," like it's, they're seeing the spaceship. Yeah. It's it's there that they're looking at, you know, and it's this huge thing. So it's really amping up what they have the ability to do. Um, my fear with that stuff is sort of the uh, other side of the coin, which is I hope they don't come to rely on that to sell the show, right? Because it's not. I mean, Star Trek for me has never been about that stuff. Uh, it's always been more about these interesting stories and sort of the intellectual aspect of it. That for me, that's what I enjoy. So, right. Um, I, you know, I, I, I hope it's just a tool and and not like you know the star of the show. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, the, the, when people would always ask me because I'm 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 in both camps. Heavy. I'm a big Star Wars fan and a big Star Star Trek fan. Uh, star Wars is mythology. Star Trek is social commentary at their best. At their best, in my opinion, Wars is all mythos. And Trek is talking about what's happening in our reality today through an interesting lens. Just twisting it a little bit on it. That that's when Trek really starts to hum. What's I thought what what's interesting about what you said before, when performers would come through the experience and they'd get to the part where they got onto the bridge of the Enterprise, they would always remark how cool it was to see it whole. Right. Not with like half of it missing with exactly, cameras. Exactly. Exactly. They were always really kind of taken with, wow, this is neat. This actually, and, and, a, and a full working uh, view screen because the technology had advanced a little bit then. It was a projector screen up on front, but that kind of thing. But yeah, that was a, a really neat treat for them to be like, Oh, this is this is immersive even for me. <laughs> and yeah, and a big shout out uh, for for people that have not been. Uh, I just want to give a sh big shout out to the Star Trek set tour up in Ticonderoga, New York. 
which if you've not seen that, that's very much the same thing, except it's full. It's all, it's the whole bridge. Wow. It's the whole bridge, the whole engine room. Oh. It's the corridor. And, you know, there's no missing parts. I mean, it's all there, <laughs> you know, and, and that is something that uh, I definitely have on my, my bucket list mm-hmm. and cannot wait to, to go out to see. But you're on that side of the country now. So I would suggest go, go check on that out. I may have to find my way out there before too long. Well, uh, let's uh, move on. Let's talk about a little Voyager. Uh, mm-hmm. On the list, you, the uh, M5 has snuck in a double feature, a two-parter here. Yes. Uh, the Year of Heck, uh, season four, <laughs> episodes eight. I always call it that. Uh-huh. Uh, season four, episode eight and nine. Uh, here we have Anorax, the villain yes. of the Krenum. We've got Obrist, his little minion. And we've got the great big temporal weapon and the Krenum time ship. Uh, so why is this episode on the list? What is so special about this episode for you, Paul? Uh, the most special thing about this episode is Kurt Woodsmith. He is a Star Trek stalwart. He's in Undiscovered Country as the Chancellor of the uh, Federation at that time. Yeah, the president. President of the Federation. President of the Federation, yeah. He's, uh, he's also, uh, he, he, he pops up a lot in Trek and sometimes you won't recognize them. That's, that's another really fun thing about Star Trek is a lot of times you go back and go, Oh my gosh, that's actually so-and-so who's been in 18,000 different iterations of the show. And I didn't realize because they were covered in Westmore magic. He is a standout always in everything he does. The fact that he brings this twisted, he's basically Mr. Freeze for you Batman fans. He's just desperate to get his wife back. That's his whole motivation. As evil as he is at his core, he, he's just a hopeless romantic. And so you, so you root for him a little bit. Chakotay gets swept up in his, in his plans mm-hmm. and starts to see, oh, maybe there's some logic to destroying countless uh, civilizations to try and yeah, fix one. erased billions of lives. I yeah. mean, the man's a monster. Why not? Why not? Let's see what we can do here. Yeah. But it also goes back to that... Uh, that animated episode and like, you know, talking to the Andorian, Hey, I'm not going to exist anymore. Okay. Yeah. This is all stuff that we're exploring more and more now that again, it, what's, what's so cool is what I love about Trek is they'll do these dives into theoretical physics and mm-hmm. theoretical science that may or may not pan out, but man, when they do pan out down the road, it's so cool to go back and revisit this stuff with fresh eyes and, you know, the possibilities of multiverses and how many times he generated how many countless multiverses by over and over resetting this area of time space. And what even is that? What even is resetting a, a, an area of time space? What are the ramifications of that? Just it's the whole episode you could probably do a doctoral thesis on if you knew enough about temporal physics and quantum manipulation i it's way above my depth but man it's fascinating stuff to ponder i love when trek just gets me thinking in big weird ways and this episode gets you thinking in big weird ways because it does kind of hit the reset button at the end but you know it there's so much other stuff happened it sort of got that little taste of the inner light there too of like, oh, what was this real? Was it not? What's a dream? What's what is a civilization? You know, you know, Paul. When it comes to the reset button, I mean, Star Trek gets a lot of flack for hitting that button uh, more than a few times. Mm. Uh, but I will say that in in the year of hell, it's organic to the show, and it's it's a time when it doesn't bother me at all, right? I mean, yeah. It's 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 totally authentic and it's how the episode would have gone. And I, I totally get it. Right. There's times I have been disturbed when watching a Star Trek episode. that I think, you know what, if if this thing happened in episode five, like in episodes six, seven and eight, this person should be in counseling or, you know, right. like having psychological problems. Right. right? Like, right, right, right. But, <laughs> but then they're like the very next episode, they're like, let's go play some Parisi squares and hang out on the holodeck or something. And I'm just like, what? You know, it's uh, it's You're very right. weird. You're right. Deanna Troy herself has suffered at the hand so much. Oh, yeah. 
Well, this is also what I bring up when people want to talk about how serialized Deep Space Nine is. And I always say it's not as serialized as you think it is, bro. Yeah. <laughs> because because if you look at how many stories there are like this, like where something really terrible happens uh-huh. you know, to a character and yeah. like next episode, they sort of minimize it or forget about it. You know, uh-huh. and you think, well, what? <laughs> you know, how is Garrick so- able to get up in the morning? That's the. <laughs> oh, my God. Right. <laughs> it totally doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, I think right. you're absolutely right. It's 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 weird to see characters go through such horrendous stuff and then just back to the day. But also, as nerds, uh, I think we recognize some of the tropes of just comic books in this, right? This is what comic books do. And if you're a fan of science fiction and comicdom, you learn to, if not appreciate, at least accept this on-off switch that happens from time to time with new creatives and new directions. I I will say that I think in the newer track, uh, Prodigy, uh, Discovery, especially Discovery and Lower Decks, um, they have not fallen prey to this. That's good. Like things actually do hold over. And if there's a hurt, it continues to hurt. Right. And they, yeah. they can fix it. They can remediate it. And, you know, things happen to make them feel better about it. But they're still a hurt, you know, and I, I do like that. And that's wonderful to see. And, and again, indicative of what I love best about Trek. It's it's social commentary. And we're in the age of it's not a stigma to go get some therapy and seek some real help. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, that's going through these things. Not You know, we're not we're no longer suppressing our traumas. Uh, where right they, they become a true part of our character. Right on. So let's talk about, uh, speaking about traumas that become part of our character, uh, let's talk about Deep Space Nine Blood Oath. That's season two, <laughs> episode 19. And here we get Kor, Kang, and Koloth from the original series who come back for a, a rousing little bit of revenge. <laughs> um, and so I, I have a, a rather substantial issue I want to ask you about. But yeah. first, I want to ask you about uh, why this episode made the list and what makes it special for you. Uh, this is another one that is there pretty much because it's Klingons. Uh, that's a big part of it. And again, it was another way, another a keystone for me to go to 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 learn about how to behave as a Klingon. Uh, because our timeline was set that we we came back in time around the start of DS9, chronologically speaking. Uh, so, you know, just trying to get a, a headset around that. And another, you know, just trying to explain away the differences in appearance. Here's these original series Klingons that now look like next-gen Klingons. What's going on? But it was cool. Nobody even talked about it. It's all good. Just go with it. Um, another layer of interpersonal relationships with Klingons That's not all war exactly. I mean, it was a lot of, there's a lot of the whole revenge thing, but the care that these men have for each other and the love that, that, that you can feel, uh, between these guys, again, just the humanizing of Klingons. It's just, it's just really cool. And also a fascinating, uh, exploration of Dax in this care in this episode i mean it's really you know it's it's jadzia's this is a showboat piece for her and i love oh, sure. that it's i love that dax character episode. i love i love the dax character and i and i really i dig it in it the ending is it's a downer episode I, a lot of these are sad a lot of these episodes are really sad and traumatic i kind of like that um it's a downer episode but it's a really brilliant ending. I feel she goes directly against Cisco and in the process loses two of her oldest friends and is complicit in a murder, whether or not it was legit or not. She comes back to the ship and it's just quiet as the grave. Everybody just exchanges knowing looks and we're done. And it was, it's, it hits heavy. It hits heavy, and I don't, I don't know that we were able to really explore as much as we could have or would have liked to have between the fallout there between uh, Dax and and Cisco, but some bad blood from all that. But that's 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 Deep Space Nine, man. Stuff does not go right. Stuff does not go well. No, I get you. I get you. So what you're actually bringing up is is something that I I I want to bring into the conversation. And I think this is something that we've actually talked a little bit about already. And it's that Star Trek has always had a lot of 
built-in sort of Kremlin revisionism when it comes to the Klingons, when it comes to the Federation, mm -hmm. when it comes to a lot of things uh, in the show. So you'd mentioned earlier how you were put off on Discovery because the death ritual concept was not what we had thought. Uh, but yet, when you look at, let's say, Kor, in the uh, original series, Kor is rounding up innocent civilians, Organians, putting them up against the wall and having them shot 200 at a time. Mm -hmm. He is a monster and is without any honor. And frankly, him getting a bullet in the head is, is generally an improvement for the galaxy. Right. So why are we supposed to care about him now, right? And this is, this is, but because it, it, it's, it is that character, right? This is yeah. not like all Klingons. No. We're, we're specifically talking about that guy. Yep. He's a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And, and so we, we're now going to rehabilitate him. So why, and then we, we're going to do the same thing in Discovery. We're going to have a different iteration of the Klingons. Now we had, you know, God, I was there nine or 10 years old in motion picture. And I see the Katinga battlecruiser the D7 battlecruiser, and all of a sudden I'm like, who are those guys inside the Klingon ship, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Because it doesn't really tell you, <laughs> right? No. It doesn't say these are Klingons, uh -huh. right? So I remember coming out of there being confused, like, who are those guys, <laughs> right? Yep. And, and, you know, I had to see the movie again and realize, oh, wait, those are Klingons. Uh -huh. uh, so Star Trek has always had this revisionism that it's done. And I, I think that a lot of times fans such as yourself and me too have gotten in trouble when we've tried to hold Star Trek to this standard of like world building that I don't think is something that was ever really inherent in the in the concept of the show. So I'll just let you react to that and then we'll see where we want to go next. I think you're absolutely right. And again, like I said, I, I know I need to give uh, Discovery another shake. It's one of those things. It, 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 it's one of the dangers of the fandom, right? Any fandom. You get comfortable with what you what you came in at, on as a fan and what resonated to you originally. And if it varies from that formula, it can't be good. But this is absolutely not true. And again, I go back to comic books. Peter Parker wasn't always married to MJ. He was, uh, for a long time, he was just a solo dude dating. When he stopped dating, people freaked out. When Gwen Stacy died, people freaked out. You know, there, there, you know, there's all these moments for better or worse. It's storytelling. It's ex, it's exploring those characters. Uh, sometimes you end up with the death of Gwen Stacy, which has ramifications and impacts that character throughout the rest of its existence. Sometimes you have the Crimson Scarlet Spider saga that, ah, you know, the clone, the clone saga. What the what? Ah, you know, or sometimes you have brand new day. God forbid. Um, <laughs> I'm not a comic book guy, so like all these words don't mean anything to me. I have to get my no friend worries. Shashank on no it worries. to help explain it's, it all to me. <laughs> it's all it's all it's all Spider Man stuff. I was a Spidey. I still am a Spidey head. Uh, but when you press the reset button and when you do revisionist stuff, you're gonna get backlash. You just are. That's why I thought was some some brilliance of the Abrams verse because it was revisionist, but it was also like, hey, if you don't like it. It's a different universe. Yeah, we split the timeline. Yeah, don't pay any attention. And part of me wants to see more of that in in, in Trek, where I can just kind of pick and choose a little bit, you know, go smorgasbord salad bar style. Uh, but like I said, like you said, it is it all. We have to grow as fans. We have to grow as fans because if anything, Trek challenges us to be broad-minded and open to change for goodness sake. Um, so I need to take my own lessons and I need to heed my own advice and I need to give these new shows their, their day in court because I am certain there's more than a handful of good in there. Uh, even if it's not every episode, even if not every character works for me, I know that at its core there, there is still going to be some interesting storytelling that I will probably enjoy and, and get some cool, cool stuff out of. You, you know, one thing you might do is you might do some live tweeting of some episodes, man. Just queue up some discovery and, and live tweet your observations. I think people would really enjoy that. Well, that's probably a good idea. So that, that's what I do. I'm rewatching Enterprise right now and I'm live tweeting my episodes. As Where are you? Uh, at Trek Profiles on Twitter. On, so. on the, on the Enterprise. Well, yes. Uh, Trek Profiles on Twitter. Oh, I mean, uh, I mean in where run. am I in the show? Yeah, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I'm uh, I'm rapidly approaching the end of season three. Okay. 
So so we're we're rapidly ending the whole Zindi arc uh, story. So I, I just gave a, I had a really bad reaction to the episode Damage, which I felt bad about because it was a it was a fine production. I mean, just as an episode, you know, there was so much to to like in it. Uh, but I found the message of the episode to be so morally offensive that I gave it one Spock. Uh, so I have my five. I give everything out of five Spocks, um, and it, it just. The, the message of the episode I found so terrible, uh, mostly because if, if you remember the episode, right, there's this other ship and they're on a little exploration mission and the Enterprise needs a part. Oh, so they yeah. take all the parts, oh, you know? Yeah. And they just kind of leave and, them derelict. And they just leave them. Yeah. And, and you, you know what I think of in my, you know what I thought of in my head? And I don't think I actually tweeted this, but I will divert for a minute. And I'll talk about it, which is I had in my head that, you know, on that alien world, that ship was the Starship Enterprise. Like there are little kids from whatever that planet was like watching those adventures and and just these super powerful, from their perspective, aliens come along and they'll be like, no, F you, I'm taking all your stuff, you know? And how would you have reacted if like in the middle of season three, like some alien comes along to the Enterprise, to the Enterprise D is like, hey, I need your warp nacelles because reasons. And they just take them and leave the crew stranded out in the middle of nowhere. And that's the end of the show. Right. Um, how horrible would that be? Uh-huh. That's what I was actually thinking. And I think, you know what? That's morally offensive. I, I'm not a fan of this uh, at all. And I, I don't like it. And while there's justification in the, in the show for it, um, I just didn't like it. So I struggled mightily. Uh, and, you know, and I understand other people can tell me I'm wrong. I get that. I'm just saying this is my my reaction to it. Sorry for bringing up all this enterprise no, stuff. No, 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 not you, at you all. You did ask. That's, a, that's, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly right. And I think that's... But I think being a Star Trek fan has allowed you to have that level of empathy for what is essentially the enemy of the show. Or the baddie of that week, or the or the person we're not. They're supposed not. To they're not the baddies. They're not baddies, but the, but 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 they're, like they're literally like these friendly aliens, and we go and we take all their stuff. <laughs> but but the fact that we have this empathy built in now, as as Star Trek fans, it is strange to see see plot lines like that and stuff like that. Yeah, well, that's that's what what gets me with disregard for for uh, former canon sometimes sometimes because I th- I I feel like it can be a slippery slope to letting go of what Trek is about. And when episodes like, like you, you just mentioned come up, it does get a little, eh. my whole problem with enterprise was always the Zindi in general. You have a litany, a rogues gallery of creatures that we have maybe seen for five minutes of screen time, hundreds to pull from. And you have the, the, the need to create six new ones that are all working together and they're and half of them are kind of dumb. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll take the opposite side of that argument, Paul. Um, I will take the opposite side of that, which is that one of the things that I legitimately, um, I don't want to say criticize, but one of the things I, I do really find a little bit eye rolly in a lot of Star Trek is like we take the ship like to the other end of the universe and we meet somebody that we already know, right? Like like everybody like it, we we come across more Klingons, we come across more Romulans, we come across like oh there's a symbiont it has to be a Dex, you know? And it's right. like stop it, like stop stop it, you know? <laughs> let's have let's have some other aliens, you know? Let's have more of there, that. There I, is I, a point I am there, all yes. for more of that. There you know, it's it's a that. great big universe out yep. there and. I never minded that at all. And I'm always interested in seeing them do new kinds of aliens, new kinds of ways of being, you know, new planets with like weird stuff going on. And I am there for that. That is like one of the things I enjoy the most (laughs) is when they go to some crazy planet and, you know, meet some really wild culture that we hadn't seen before. I'm I'm down for that. I guess I can see that if there had been a focus on one, you know, one and really some world building, but we just, we get, we don't even learn much about half the Zindi. And when the Andorians finally start to really get fleshed out, that's when I thought enterprise took off when they really invested in another alien species, getting the, the, the Ferengi treatment as it were. Uh, right on, but right you know, on. Yeah, but I, but I see your school of thought from it too. Absolutely. All right. Well, then let's uh, move on and let's talk about let's just do one more. Uh, Let's do TNG season five, episode 24, the next phase. 
Yes. With the with the fantastic and glorious uh, Ro Laren, uh, yes. where she believes that she is dead with her with her new BFF for all eternity, Jordy LaForge, <laughs> as they are going to be haunting the halls of the Enterprise D for all time. So this one seemed to be the most uh, unusual one on the list, I think, the furthest standard deviations away from the others. So I have to ask you, what's going on here, Paul? Did you have a scare or something or, or what's going on? This was one of my favorites as a kid. Uh, actually watching this during first run, I was just like, this is so cool how they figure this all out. And I also have a soft spot for the buddy episodes when two characters pair up and suddenly you know that you don't see all the time together and there's not a ton of those but there are some there's a, a great one in enterprise with um trip and uh what's the name uh malcolm malcolm when they're stuck off in the shuttlecraft that shuttle pod one yes beautiful episode right just just let's do some character study piece it's it's the theater nerd in me because these these are these could be some of these this stuff could just be a stage play right um uh, it's waiting for godot with the with <laughs> two yeah, starfleet officers two guys in a room sitting uh, drinking a bunch of liquor exactly exactly so we got uh you know true west with uh klingons so that could be cool but you know we've got uh row which like you just said i i couldn't have said it better what an awesome character and I suppose you know that Roe was supposed to be uh, Kira Norris. Right, yeah. right, right. Which right. is, yeah. she, she didn't want the part. Forever yeah. heartbreaking to me that that didn't happen that way. Uh, you know, props to Kira, but my goodness, what a, what a, uh. and again, just being able to dive into characters that we already have some backstory on instead of having to spend a, a TNG first season again, like we always do. It's like, let's let's build on some of our successes here, people. We don't you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but uh, but they figure it out by the end, and they bring in half of yeah, next generation, yeah, yeah. half well, of next generation crew. You. I mean, I can't I, I can't criticize the show for that because I mean they they wrote it that way. That's what they wanted to do. Yeah. It's just you know the actor didn't want the part, right? Hey. So. There's, there's nothing you can do in no, that situation. And I right? totally understand. I mean, I'm, she was out there looking for other stuff and didn't want to get pigeonholed. I left a Trek gig myself to go do other stuff. You know, uh, I get it. I totally understand why you, uh, us creative people have that drive to not do the same thing over and over again. But at the same time, when uh, as you as you get older as a, a performer, uh, you realize that those kinds of plums don't come around every every right uh, on. every day and to be able to give a character uh, a full life throughout several series what a what a treat but it's hard to see that in the moment i mean even like you know like john ham from mad men he went through that you know he was desperate to go do movies he ended up creating something iconic but he also didn't get to go get to go do movies and that was driving him more crazy than being in this role that will define him for his lifetime it's it's but you know how do you balance that but then she ended up being back in Battlestar, so uh yeah that was yeah cool. michelle forbes <laughs> went on to have a great career yeah, so she's great. you can't yeah she's no, just fantastic she's great and, she, yeah yeah she was gonna she was gonna land on her feet no matter what and she did yeah for sure i mean she's definitely a superstar and a tremendous talent and mm -hmm. i think you know we're we're glad to have what we had of her in the show yep. right mm -hmm. uh and we can uh sort of think about what might have been, but I think Deep Space Nine came out just fine. Um, I, I, but it's entertaining to think about how it would have been stepped up. I don't think we ever would have gotten Worf in the show uh, if if we had Rolaire and I think. You're probably right. Yeah, you're probably right. And uh, yeah, the, so this is another episode where the Romulans come off as the worst people in the world, but that's just kind of how they are. But again, it's another one of those moments where whacked out uh, science theory that may actually be science fact and the fun of chroniton particles. And I just never get enough of the audacity of Romulans using black holes to power their ships. Pretty crazy, right? Icarus has nothing on these people. They are just spitting in the face of God, daring, <laughs> daring the powers of the universe to try and trifle with them, to harness the, the most, what could be the most powerful force in the universe. And I thought what was also really interesting too, uh, this also kind of, had hints about um, what ended up being uh, the stuff with the Romulans in in the in the in the uh, Abrams verse with the red matter mm -hmm. and Nero's whole thing. 
anytime they start dealing with chroniton particles and temporal flux and it, I, 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 I love that stuff. I love that. Stuff. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I, the one thing I would say is if you like Romulan stuff, uh, you should check out the Picard show. The first season is heavy Romulan. Um, I did not- watch, I did watch uh, a chunk of Picard. Oh, okay. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. yeah. So there's lots of Romulan stuff in there. And uh, Michael Shabon, who was involved in the show, um, if you follow him, I believe on Instagram, he has put out a whole bunch of like research documents that he wrote at, and I don't know if it's for the show Bible or just stuff he wrote for himself, but all about like Romulan culture and like how the family structure works Ooh. and things like that. Cause there's like a brother sister story and he's like, how, how does all this happen? And it, there's some really wild stuff in there, man. <laughs> That's all I'll I say. Bet. I bet. <laughs> That's all I'll I, say about let's that. Let's go. Well, you know, and what happened to the Remans? Where's the last Reman we saw? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, you, you, you can't get it. You can't be told all the stories, right? There always has to be room for more stories. Exactly. Right? So you, you exactly. can't you can't expect that. Yep. So uh, I got to say, Paul, we've been talking for a couple hours now. Um, it seems like Star Trek has been a constant thing in your life since even at a very young age. Uh, and now you're spending a couple hours talking to some weirdo on the Internet about it. <laughs> Why does Star Trek matter to you? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, you moved all the way across the country just so you could be tangentially involved in Star Trek. Yeah. What's going on here? Yeah. I love the lunacy of it. I love the, the minutia. You can lose yourself in trivial, crazy facts. And I, just, I find that stuff really, really fun. You can speak a different language, basically, with other Trek heads if you know enough about it. And then underneath that, when you crack that layer of nerd cred and I know how such and such engine works and you know all this kind of stuff, you get down to the core of it and it's it's just a way for people to relate to each other in a in an easier way. Again, it's 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 allegory and it's social commentary and it breaks the ice in so many unique ways for people to have conver- difficult conversations about hard subjects. And that's always been its legacy from original series on. So that's what I, I, I love that. It's just, it's just, it's crazy. Star Trek's crazy. It's full of lunacy, but when you get into, once you get into it, once, if you get pulled in by that madness and, Let's go see the weird alien under that is just what, you know, what is it to be human? That's always been it. And like you were saying, you were talking earlier about Gene and his picayunes. He was a wild man, but wow, did he have some insight into the human condition? And a lot of the writers that he brought onto that project early on did too. And that's what continues to shine through. It is a it is a safe space to talk about really difficult stuff. Yeah. And I and we more than ever do we need that now. Yeah. Well, Paul, I've enjoyed our conversation, but the M5 has alerted me oh, that it no. is now time for the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> ah! The Kobayashi Maru is a challenging and difficult test, cunningly prepared just for you by the M5. Should you not only survive the test, but pass it as well, the M5 will award you an honorary Star Trek title on behalf of our little program. I'll take it. Are you ready to face the Kobayashi Maru, Paul? Let's go. M5, load the Kobayashi Maru simulation and prepare to record Paul's responses. The M5 is processing. You can only choose one. Engage the warp engines or fire the phasers. Warp engines. Choose your honorable vacation destination, Boreth or Kronos. Uh, Kronos. You must bring a feline companion on your next deep space mission. Will it be Spot, Grudge, or Isis? Spot. You are invited to be a guest at the next Dax Giantara. Would you rather have drinks with Curzon or play Dabo with Jadzia? Jadzia Dabo. Which is scarier, Klingon friend? Feklir or Gowron's eyes at full burn? Gowron. <laughs> <laughs> The Feckler's not even necessarily real. (laughs) 
Simulation complete. M5, please compute the results and tell us if our guest has passed the Kobayashi Maru. Analyzing. Paul, I am pleased to tell you that the M5 has calculated that you have passed the Kobayashi Maru simulation. Congratulations. Whoa, amazing. And now, the M5, who has analyzed your answers, will award you an honorary Star Trek title on behalf of our podcast. M5, what title shall we award our guest? Paul Mattingly is awarded the title of headliner at the Chuckle Hot on Riza. I'll so take there it. You go. I'll take it. That totally, that totally fits with what I do. That's my combination. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, everyone should go catch his show at the Chuckle Hut. It's going to be amazing, I'll tell you. And, you know, there might be Jamaharum afterwards. I don't even know. Okay. Get your whore guns here. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, please tell people how they can get in touch with you and tell us about your uh, tell us about your podcasting adventures if people want to check you out there. Yeah, so I'm uh, one half of a two man comedy duo. My comedy partner is Matt Donnelly. He works uh, very closely with Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller. He is on his Penn Sunday School every week, and um, he's an aspiring magician himself. He's actually at the Magic Castle right now doing a run of shows, which is an incredible honor and a real uh, no mean feat uh, for, a, for a young and up-and-comer uh, magician. I say young up-and-comer magician. He got started late, but he's, he's new to the magician game. But he's doing really, really well. Uh, Matt Donnelly, the mind noodler, he goes by for his, uh, his magician stuff. So, uh, yeah, but we, uh, we host a, a podcast called Matt and Mattingly's Ice Cream Social. We broadcast twice weekly. We're based out of Las Vegas. They're still in Vegas. I just moved out to Pennsylvania. But for many, many years, we were broadcasting out of Las Vegas uh, primarily. I'm going back in uh, April. We're having our big convention, uh, Scoop Fest, we call it. All of our listeners we call Scoops as our ice cream social heads. And uh, Scoop Fest is happening at the end of April. So you can go to heyscoops.com. Simple to remember, heyscoops.com, and you'll find all the information on Matt Mattingly's Ice Cream Social. You can listen to episodes right from there or any streaming uh, platform you so choose. And we have a shop, and we have uh, info about our convention and all kinds of stuff like that, and uh, some funny videos and stuff as well. And if they want to follow you personally to bring you to task for not being a completionist and to give you grief over your uh, uh, failure to accept Klingon revisionism, where, where should they find you? Please do so. I am at the famous Paul on Twitter, and I am pretty active on Twitter, so I will get back to you. Uh, if, you're, if you're nice, I'll even follow you, probably. Yeah, so uh, please uh, feel free to reach out and say, hey, I love chatting with my listeners and uh, I'd love to hear from you guys as well. This has uh, been a, a real fun opportunity. Paul, thank you so much for being part of Trek Profiles. Oh, so great to be here. Thank you, John. Here ends this installment of the Trek Profiles podcast. And before we offer a Trek quote to close this episode, I'd like to remind you that you may send us your friendly messages, your hateful screeds of fury, or TikTok videos of yourself doing the new unwound workout routine to feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. Anything you send me. Maybe using the show, or it might be thrown into a bizarre Dickensian Christmas nightmare scenario inside of the Nexus. And speaking of some things which were not thrown into the Nexus, some portions of the Kobayashi Maru questions in this very episode were written by listener Adam Saunders. We thank Adam for his contributions. This time, I leave you with a quote from Klingon Captain Kor, who in the episode Blood Oath said, quote, Of course you should come. The splendor of fighting and killing. A bloodbath in the cause of vengeance. Who wouldn't want to come? Close quote. Thanks for listening and live long and prosper. This handcrafted podcast is brought to you by Stars and Sky Media Lab. It's cosmic. Thing set up, ready to go. Um, as far as then sending you that file later, uh, do you have like a Dropbox I can 
plop that into afterwards or yeah you can yeah i can uh, grant you access to a dropbox uh icloud drive we transfer box.net um google drive i do all the I things should always man. i should always trust that trek fans are way ahead of me on on all things technological <laughs> okay great uh awesome 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 <laughs> So I know you didn't want to uh, talk much about yourself on the on the podcast, but can I just ask what your Trek sure. background is? I see uh, the Enterprise uh, in the background there, and are those oh, yeah. like stamp collections? Th th this is all Star Trek stuff. So yeah. that's uh, that's the U.S. Postal Service uh, USS Star Trek USS Enterprise stamp TOS mm -hmm. era. Uh, that's the uh, uh, also from the U.S. Postal Service. That's the stamps from that. That's the Royal Mail. Uh, over in the UK, that's yes. their stamps. Um, and I just like, I'm not a stamp guy. I just like them because I thought they were just incredibly cool art and they, they I was able to get them framed like that. Yeah. Um, that's my original Spock art. So that is um, a, a hand painted uh, Mr. Spock, every version of him that appeared in the original series. Oh, wow. All the different outfits. So, well, yeah. Wow. That's sold from his, his shop from that, from that, that shop. The LAP. Estate, huh? oh, wow. Yeah. That's his, his company that he started with his granddaughter. And I bought it from them in person at the convention about five years ago. Oh, cool. Uh, so that's nice. That's number five. There's only a hundred of those. So that's number five. Very nice. And, and that right up there, you'll appreciate this. That's Klingon Chef from Deep Space Nine. <laughs> so there's a there's a guy on Twitter, Lee Sargent. I don't know if you know him, but he just he's he's a guy in Australia and he does a lot of Star Trek art and other things too. But he always oh, is posting Star Trek doodles and things like that. And he posted Klingon Chef. And I was like, oh Lee, that's awesome, man. Makes me want to sing Klingon opera. And he's like, I absolutely dare you to sing Klingon opera. I was like, Stand by, bro. Done. Here we go. <laughs> and I belted out some Klingon opera uh, on Twitter. And he's, he goes, send me your address. I'm going to send you something. Wow. So that is an original uh, Lee Sargent uh, of Klingon Chef, who is That's my favorite Klingon. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Even though he's only in two episodes. Right. But, uh, I, I love Klingon Chef. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm one of these people. I've been a fan my whole life. So there was never a time I, um, I, I have not been a Star Trek fan. <laughs> oh man Gowron with those eyes yes sir oh, amazing did, did, now did you ever try to work on a Gowron eye glare did, did was that was that in your repertoire uh mine i i had well like i said we had the, the the luck of the 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 mask already gave you this very imposing uh brow line uh -huh. so it's cutting right there so i was just always i did i did open my eyes quite wide during while i was at, when i would go out on 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 the floor I was always very intently staring at people, so yeah, I would. You, this is this is these are the eyes you would get, but it wasn't like <laughs> bugging out, but it was, uh, and it was always from here, you know, like like really underneath, like under the brow. Yeah, 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 like 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 a shark peering up, just barely uh, able to see. But yeah, I I would I would stare at people from across the entirety of the of the floor and just freak them out that way. Yeah, and then, uh, but I, I I wasn't about jump scares or anything like that, or or trying to scare people. And when kids would come up, I would always kneel down and and get on their level and talk to them, uh, you know, unless they were terrified, then I wouldn't even mess with them. Uh, but uh, <laughs> which, which which happened occasionally. But yeah, uh, I, you, I, nobody can do the Gowron eyes except Gowron. I almost brought this up when we were recording the show, but uh, you were talking about the fact that uh, uh, which actor was it? They're like, uh, I want to do something different, right? I don't want to um, do the same uh, the thing. The lady anymore. who was in uh, Ro Lauren as she left. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that that's actually Christopher Lloyd's thing. He's, he's like, you know, I can imagine the conversation he had with his agent. And he's like, do not bring me any more comedic roles. I will never do Doc Brown again. Right. I am not going to do that. I am not going to do any more comedy roles. You know, great, Scott. I'm done with it. Bring me something else. And they bring him that. I mean, he was known for... Back to the Future and Reverend Jim from Taxi, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, I cannot do either of these things again. What's yeah. a stretch? And he did Krug, and he was amazing, right? I mean, I will. It's one of my favorite little bits in all of Star Trek. He's when, an like, awesome Klingon. He's he's wrestling those giant worms, oh. and then he picks up the communicator, and he's like, 
ship, nothing happening here. Like, and he plays it like <laughs> legit, right? He's not like being a jokester or, mm-hmm. a, you know, he's not, there's no snark no. or, you know, wink and a nod. No. It's, it's literally like it's 10 o'clock. I've just defeated these giant worm things. I'm still looking for the other guys. I'll be back in touch, you know? And it's like, okay, <laughs> I know what this guy's about. Like, yeah. you, you know, you know everything about him right yeah, then and there. No nonsense Klingon. <laughs> yeah. That's where, that's where I learned my, uh, Choi Chu. To, uh, that's right to, get, transport me up yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh maltz uh john yeah. larroquette from night court right is is uh maltz is, the is he maltz yeah you're kidding me no See, it's john larroquette from night court i didn't know that yeah that's he's a, maltz. That's, a, that's a trivia piece i didn't know all right well then here's a little bit for you which is if you go to the klingon dictionary the the bit at the front uh, that Mark Okerund is writing the little front matter. Yeah. He actually says like he thanks Maltz in the acknowledgments <laughs> for all his help in fixing the translations, <laughs> which is one of my favorite little things in that book. Just, you know, the shout out to Maltz, the officer yeah, yeah, Maltz. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do not deserve to live. Right. Well, he ends up helping Mark Okerund write the Klingon dictionary. What are you going to do? <laughs>